what does it mean to be a cultural catalyst? I think it's somebody in the world who's actually doing it. So yeah. you can have great ideas and you can really believe that things could be done, but are you willing to actually get your hands in there and be like, ooh, here we go. Like, I'm going to take a risk and get my hands all the way in. And in my case, you know, leave just the social justice world and be like, God, you still love and value the business people. Like, there's so many verses in the Bible about wealth and poverty, there as is. you know. And I felt so justified as a young person in my poverty-focused career. And I needed to really, in humility, step into being like, I can be a business owner and leader who worships God with my work every day. Welcome to Cultural Catalyst, where we teach you how to live fully live, co-labor with God, and change the world. And I'm your host, Chris Valentin. Today, I have Kate Masson, and Kate is a very interesting person. Her and her husband own Ray's Recruiting, and they have over 500 employees in six countries. They're from Canada, and their company has been rated one of the five best companies in, the, in Canada to actually work in. So she is, she is, she's a very interesting person, really, really excited to have this conversation with her and really talk about the business world today. Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor. Appreciate you a lot. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your backstory? Sure. You are a student, right? You're, this is your third year student in school of ministry. I am. So yes. tell us a little bit about that, about your company and how you actually got in this business. Well, why don't we start with how Tim and I ended up in the business? Ooh, why don't we it, do that? The very beginning. So, um, I, my backstory a little bit is that I was basically a Christian social worker for the majority of my career, uh, post-university, studied television, and never thought that I would ever be in a position of uh, owning a company, let alone a staffing company. It wasn't exactly like a passion. And um, You went from being a social worker to a businesswoman. Yeah, I ran a neighborhood community center for immigrants to Canada. So people who were wow. who had just arrived to Canada, barely spoke the language, um, were just figuring out how to feed their kids and get used to a new country. And it was a super poor neighborhood. It was I was very passionate about it and loved the work. And at that uh, around the time, I was just about 28 years old, and um, my husband's father got super sick with early onset Alzheimer's. They had been uh, running this business wow. since the 80s. It's a it was they were second generation family owners and uh it was a hard time like everybody was looking around the family being like what are we going to do yeah and we just decided very innocently slightly naive to just go for it and to say okay we will step into this and take ownership of a business so at the age of 30 and tim was 32 we found ourselves with 150 staff we were responsible for and um no major business background so this whatsoever. is like a family business yeah so yeah. your father or it's, tim's father it's tim's father and his grandmother started it in the 50s which was oh my uh, gosh. almost unheard of at the time yeah she multi-generational was, business yeah it's really beautiful pretty actually. wild yeah. People were happy to quote us the stats of what happens to third generation <laughs> owners. And do you know what those stats say? Yeah, not they're not good. good. Yeah. yeah, they're not good. So, yeah, it was a huge transition time, actually. Like, I went from uh, really believing that I was going to work with the poor for the rest of my life yeah. and just caring for them so deeply and to all of a sudden being in a responsible position to steward wealth. And wow. that transition was like 180 degrees for me. Was that business going well when you guys took it over? And what exactly does this business do? Um, was the business doing well? I think prior to Tim's dad getting sick, it was doing really well. Okay. It was a happy place to work. People yeah. loved working there. And then during his decline, it was actually, I don't know if you've ever known somebody who goes through Alzheimer's. It's a bit, it can be a slow decline. You're not yeah. really sure exactly what's happening. Yeah. And during that time, things started to really fall apart. Wow. And what we do with staffing is we basically, at the highest level, just help other companies hire people. And so okay. it's the, recruiting. It, okay, yeah. it's recruiting employees. Yes. And those employees, they work for you guys and you and you subcontract them to other companies or you help them find 
mostly that's the way it works. It's contract it. workers and Got then it. we're the employer of record. And so when we came in, Tim and I were really motivated as really naive, young, innocent people to do business differently. So we had met in a camp background. That's where Tim and I met when we were quite young. We actually got married at camp. And then in our young married years. Like a Christian camp? Yeah. Or, okay, yeah got Christian it. summer camp. Got it. Yeah. Kind of like a classic Hallmark movie. Um, <laughs> kind of not really. But uh, then we had this, we had the summers of our lives working together. We would get, get paid no money. Um, once we were married, we were directors of like a teen camp. So we would have 80 staff 200, 300 kids would come in and we would do these blowout weeks. And at one point, somebody that we were working with said, this feels like heaven, which is a bizarre thing to say because you were getting basically no sleep. You were working your butt off for no pay. Yeah, no pay. None whatsoever. But um, I, I think that we looked back on that time and just thought, There were things we put in place that and people ended up loving working with us. And I don't say that with a lot of ego, but we just were were a couple that could cast vision, love people, care for them. And we just thought, how can you do this in a business setting? So from that point on, kind of the roller coaster began and we took over this business. Did you ever have any business experience? None. Did I, Tim. Have a, I have a television background. Tim is a software developer. So so, Tom, so Tim didn't grow up. I mean, his dad was doing business, yes. but he didn't actually work in the da- in, in the family business, no, so to speak. He had had a conversation with his dad at a yeah. young age, basically saying, I don't think that this is my direction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was just like, bless ya. But he ended up starting his own company as a software developer. But we're talking a staff of like three to five people yeah. and one major client that is not a staff of 150 people Wow. with multiple multiple PLs to manage. So wow. massive transition. So when you guys when you guys got involved, well first of all, one beautiful thing, kind of like my wife and I, like you already learned to work together, you and Tim. Yeah. Yep. So you a lot of couples can't work together. Yes. We met working together. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy. Yeah. And my wife and I, we've worked together since actually yeah. since the uh, a month after we were married. We've never oh, I've never awesome. worked at a company that didn't include her. Amazing. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool, right? Yep. So you guys got along, okay, took over the company. Company was doing fairly well yep. until your 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 father in law got Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so by the time you guys took the company over, was it in crisis? I'd say borderline. Like borderline. it was pretty close. Okay. What was happening was that people were siloed. So you had all of these people who were actually competing for the same business, and nobody yeah. was talking to one another. It was kind of like the classic turf wars junk that ends up happening in a company and then there was actually some really poor behavior where there was some borderline theft happening but uh and we only found that out afterwards just super super sad um but we came in and people for the most part were behind us they were like we believe in you until we started being disruptors and then things got tricky because disrupting because you were changing you were changing culture you were changing the way they did business basically Yeah. Yeah. We just said we want people to learn to trust one another. And so we started coming in with kind of kingdom principles at a in a very different way. Yeah. Tim's parents, hardcore, beautiful Christians, like incredibly okay. f- like uh, philanthropy minded. Yeah. So they they did great at making money. Yeah. And um, it wasn't so much a focus on the business practices. Yeah. And they did incredible giving and gifting. Yeah. And we wanted to continue that legacy. Yeah. But we knew that there was more. That we knew that there was a new way that we could approach doing business together with a team. And um, and I'd say it took us five years to actually start to see the results that we thought we would see in eighteen months. It took a long time. So when you took the business, did it kind of go the opposite way for a while? Did you start losing customers? You're kind of, you got that look on your face like, oh, why'd you ask me that question? Yeah, we had some, we had some rough times. Like, um, I think year two, we had 40% turnover. So that was probably the year, wow. which can you imagine? Transition that? though. That is a massive number. Yeah, yep. massive number. And um, that was when people were like, either like, we'd rather just work in the status quo. And that's when people who are wonderful went to other staffing companies or just self like opted out. Or it was also just us cleaning house and just saying like, some of these rules are finished and no longer have purpose. Um, but, and then we lost some money within that. I think it was year three. 
we tried something new and lost a significant amount. So there are those years where you're like, are we going to be the people who this ends with? Yeah. Like, let that not be so. It felt like a ton of pressure. You're going to make the the rumor true, right? Yeah. Third generation is the please. one that goes broke. Yeah, please, God, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we really believed that he was with us. You yeah. know, we were like, we are going to build and we are heading towards a culture of honor. Yeah. And so we were started reading tons of books. Like, we've always read books. Um, and... Some of the classics were Patrick Lencioni, Dennis Bakke, like The Joy of Work. And then we read, we came across this book that changed everything for us, and it was called The Decision Maker. And basically, wow. the principle behind that book is that people, the fun in business is found in making decisions. And usually only a small handful of people get to experience that fun and then have to implement the decisions. But what would happen if you empowered people who are closest to a problem or an opportunity to actually make the decision? And we started ruffling some feathers with that and started experimenting. And we started putting systems and processes in place that would allow for everybody to become a decision maker, which eventually, I don't know if it was probably around year seven, we just went to a structure that we don't have managers anymore. You don't have managers managers. We don't. Okay. I've never heard of a business without managers. So I'm very intrigued by what could I do to not need managers. So we're going to put up the chart yep. and then why don't you explain it to us and explain like how you got to this place where you don't use managers. And then, you know, I think of all kinds of questions like, you know, we, we have managers at Bethel, we mm -hmm. have 800 employees, lots of managers. And I know what our managers do, you know, yep. handle conflict, motivate people, make sure yep. that we're on the same page for goals. So explain to me how you can do away with that with the structure. Sure. So let's think about managers as parents. Okay. We do not have like parent-child relationships in Got our it. company. Okay. So we, and it has taken us a while to get here. So I would never say to anybody overnight, do away with your managers, yeah. just scrap it all and head to our model. It'll be perfect. It will solve all your problems. Yes. That's not going to actually happen. You have to train for this to work. Got it. And you also have to hire adults. And so you want to hire people who are empowered and, and believe that they're capable of making decisions and handling their own conflicts. So, so, so number one, you got to hire the right people. Yes. You're not looking for people who want to be like have a slave mentality. Absolutely. Who have to be told what to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's number one. Yep. And number two, we want to do this slowly. So if you, you get you get excited about this. You want to have, you want to create time for transition. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's talk about what does it look like. Okay, so you want to empower people to own decision making. So okay. as a, um, what does a manager do? They usually have to figure out how to make decisions, who makes them, and then what the outcome is and how to hold people accountable for that outcome. Yes. But what would happen if people started holding themselves accountable for okay. outcomes? And then the second part is that a manager often ends up getting involved in is conflict. So like, how are we solving conflicts? Yes. But the structure that we built and developed actually goes through systematically both of those things. So how do we make decisions? And then how do we handle conflict? And there's actually a flow chart for almost any situation. So the flow chart at the top is like, well, what kind of problem is it? And if it's a people problem, we lean this way. If it's an opportunity in the business, we do this process. And if it is, there's a few different avenues you can go. Like if it is a role issue, we have something, for example, called the role advice process where people can actually change their jobs. So there are many different avenues that like, you could look at that whole chart. Yeah, you should study the chart. We'll put the, start, the chart up for you. Mm -hmm. And we'll also give you a link to it. Absolutely. So that you can click on it and then, you know, actually study it, download it, look at it for yourselves and then ask yourself questions and how you would solve different issues that you're already having yeah. by looking at this chart and kind of imagining what it would look like to go right. over time yeah. from the way you're doing it to the way that this, the way you have it charted out mm -hmm. here. And I would say when I look back at how we started and what we began with, we started with some basics. So like we taught our, once we were like, okay, we're headed towards a culture of honor. How are we doing this? Number one, we believe that people need to trust one another. Yeah. So we started on like, how do you develop trust with each other? What are some practices and tools you can do in meetings that develop a sense of safety? How is everyone having an opportunity to speak and participate in things? And how are, how are we knowing that we're appreciating people's perspectives? So that is one piece. The second one was feedback. So not a lot of cultures have excellent feedback models because it's scary. 
Like yeah. who wants to be in a constant world where you're like, I looking over your shoulder, like, yeah. is someone going to tell me that I'm doing something wrong today or great? And you got, you need to like work on demystifying what feedback actually is and what the purpose of it is. Yeah. Like the purpose is to connect with somebody's heart and to actually just help them. It's such a crazy gift. Like when you think about it at its deepest level, like this went really well to get today. Yeah. Here's why. And here's the impact it had on me. We use a really simple tool and um, it's in the model and it's the foundational tool. I would say we built everything from. Now, do you still have leaders? At we all? do. Yep. So you yep. still have leadership yep. in your, you just, you're just not, you're not controlling and managing people. That's right. But you do have leaders. Yep. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And some, somebody who sees a problem or opportunity at the company can actually say, hey, I see this. And they are empowered to make a decision about it. So they fo follow something called um, the decision making advice process. They post it online. Hey, here's something that I'm working on. It's a problem I see. Does anybody else see it? Does anyone have advice? I'm going to go and make a decision about it. And it's very structured and people can provide advice. And then um, you can only really block a decision if it's going to have a negative impact on the company. So that's a very powerful tool. Wow. Yeah. What's uh, What's been the most unexpected challenge or lesson that you faced in your leadership journey? Yeah. You know, regarding developing others, and and how how did you how did you adjust? How did you approach it? How did you solve the problem? Uh, I think my problem was probably an internal one around control. Mm -hmm. So when we were first looking at this model and just getting our head around like, hey, if we empower people to do this, I remember Tim taking me out for dinner and saying, yeah. once we rip the bandaid off and say, we're going in this direction, yeah. it's like, it's almost irreversible. Like yeah. you can't put, what's the phrase? Like, I'm terrible at that. A cat back in the bag. Like yeah. you can't do that. It's, yeah. it's out and it's done. Yeah. And I was scared. So I think the challenge for me there was like, it, dealing and grappling with the issue of control at work as an owner and leader and knowing that you're accountable. We're, in, we're accountable to people we owe money to. We're accountable to God for how we're stewarding this yeah. place. Uh, and what if somebody makes a terrible decision? Like what if we outsource control and and invite people to participate in that? How will we deal with the fear? And personally, me, how would I deal with that? And I had to wrestle with that for a little while. It was now, complicated. Th you know, because we're all dealing with humans, there is yeah. no structure that's perfect, right? It, it doesn't always no. go perfect. No. Uh, whether you have a management system, whether you have the best leaders in the world, where you hire the best team, the best employees, yeah. which I think Bethel has, but we have our share of problems. Um, and what's, what's some of the greatest challenges you have you know, now that you're you're in this, you know, mm. have you have you ever thought, oh my gosh, this isn't working? Or yeah. have you ever had somebody that you hired that just didn't go with the flow, like they yeah. just didn't fit? Yeah. Like, how yeah. did you solve that? You know, what's what's that like? Uh, well, it's painful. <laughs> like, it's never not been. This has not been a walk in the park. Yeah. And while it's an amazing ideal, mm -hmm. you do have to grapple with the practical implications of it and the reality yeah. and the painful stuff is when people's values don't line up to the values that you espouse yeah. right like you're like that we would love for someone to come into the belief system for example that people are capable of change that's necessary within yeah. our work like, yeah it's one that, of your core values yeah that people are and so you can you can work with people who eventually you can't make people drink from the water you can lead them but like if they're yeah. not going to get there and you have to part ways that's been wildly painful over time but i think you can still exit people with honor you know we read yeah. we, of all the books we read obviously like a danny silk book would have been super important yeah. at the beginning um later on your poverty riches and wealth book super helpful in mentality shift Did that you kind get of that? thing poverty riches and wealth right here Got a little plug. So true. Didn't tell you to say that. It's not in the notes. No, it's not in the notes. There but it, it really did help. You know, when, yeah. when you're working with belief shifting and yeah. shifting your mindset, you need material that is super, super useful. Yeah. yeah. What is your ultimate goal in business? Hey, that's a really good question. Now, you would get two different answers. Okay. From, give, them, give them both. From me and from my husband. Oh. So, I'm going to speak for him. He's in the room. He won't mind. But what he would say, can I tell you his goal yes, and absolutely. his call, his, his goal and call are actually super different than mine. So he had a radical encounter here, actually, about a decade ago. Okay. He came. He came to one of your business conferences. Got it. Um, he had never even heard of Bethel. So I was like, you should just check this out. Like Maybe I actually. Andy Mason, huh? Yeah, for sure. It yeah. was Andy. Yeah. And uh, he had such a radical encounter here. Met the Holy Spirit like for the first time wow. in, a, in a really rocking way. And heard the Lord say, um, 
the call in your life is to set a generation of souls free from slavery at work. And so his goal is to make work meaningful and full of purpose. And this is a Dan Pink thing, purpose, mastery, and autonomy. But he believes that work is meant to, to impact. It's the greatest tool that there is, I actually think, in terms of the Western structure, it's the greatest tool to impact culture. If you do business well, you're not only serving your customers, but you are serving like employees and then all of their families. So we employ people in Ghana and India and the Philippines and their experience of work. We have the opportunity to either make it radically excellent and full of kingdom values, like with generosity and transparency, mm -hmm. and they're involved and engaged and they have a sense of purpose, or we could be incredibly oppressive. As many people who from the Western world who outsource business, they are oppressive in staffing especially. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, business has the power to change entire communities. It, it absolutely does. does. So that. that is like Tim's vision and call in his life. And he's doing an incredible job. His like, we're into this like 14, 15 years. There've been many years that we were like, well, maybe we should just consider like, is this it? Yeah. Have we had it? But um, it takes perseverance, like, as you know. Okay. But now you said that your mission is quite different than your husband's. Yeah. My mission primarily is to love people. Like that's the call in my life. And it is, um, and it, is a really beautiful dovetail to Tim's because Tim yes. will be strategic and and just have a very good game plan of how we're going to move something forward. Yeah. And I come into the business and people know why they're there from a heart call. Like they're like, oh, we loved here. Like this yeah. works for us well. And I don't actually want to belittle or diminish that. There is so much power in people feeling safe at work and like knowing that they have a, a purpose beyond just the task at the end of the day, that they're seen and known as people that we would care about their families that like I would champion somebody I've championed somebody who took over my job for example for five years wow. who came out of a, a pretty broken and dysfunctional upbringing and she'd be okay with me saying that yeah. and I think she would also be okay with me saying that like working at our company has absolutely changed her life wow yeah she owns a home like we've done we've done been able to do the things in years of plenty where we've done profit sharing that blesses people abundantly and that to me is like the greatest joy ever and so my purpose in business is if people could thrive working for us just absolutely thrive at every single level that they would that they would experience exactly what Tim is talking about like meaning and work yeah Man, my mind exploding with questions because, you know, I, I was, was in business for 20 years. Yep. We have 800 employees at Bethel. Mm -hmm. Wonderful people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I think I think it's probably one of the, well, probably I think best people in the world. Yes. And I, I would agree think, with you. I hope you yeah. think that too. I would agree. With, with you. your people, you yeah. know. Yeah. But, uh, but also very challenging. People it, are it, people everywhere you people go. People are people yep. and everybody's had, got issues. And yep. no matter what structure you use, you yep. still have to confront people yep. and work with people. Uh, okay, so when I listen to you, first of all, I want to say that I can see why you're one of the five best uh, companies in Canada to actually work. Oh, you know, thank you. Work for your workplace. Yeah. Um, I can see, like, wow, that's amazing. Okay, so here's where I go. One of the goals of business has to be to also make a profit. Yes, you Would do. you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it should be the most important thing. It's there. But you you don't have a business for very long if you can't make a profit, right? Yes. You have to create sustainability. Yeah. So when I hear you say all this, the challenge that I have, and even at Bethel sometimes, you know, we went through a season at Bethel where we were kind of in this model, like our job as leaders is to make your dreams come true. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, so, you know, so, help, and so we we ended up with this language where, you know, you come to work for Bethel and one of our, one of our goals is to help your dreams come true. Mm. And like, it, it wasn't very long before people were like, Hey, I don't want to do this job. I want to do this job. Yeah. I don't want to do this job. Yeah. I want to do this job. I don't really like my job. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I think our heart was right. Yeah. I, I think that we're actually trying to do a job too. Mm -hmm. we're like we do have a job to do. We're serving this congregation. We're serving this movement of all, you know, ultimately mm -hmm. serving God. And, and it, it became like, uh, it, I may be exaggerating a little bit, mm. but it did feel like for a while that it, it's all about, like life is all about you. Yeah. And and I'm like, well, the bigger picture for us is like, we are called to serve these people. Yes. So, and, and you know, we're, we're a nonprofit. So arm, you know, we have to create sustainability. So we do have to have enough income to make sure that we're here next year. Yep. 
but we're not we're not out to make a profit. Right. But when you're in business, that is a big part of what you do. Yeah. So how are you balancing like making a profit mm -hmm. with also this, you know, come to work for us. This is, you know, you're, you're not saying this, your dreams are going to come true, but you're saying you're going to yeah. love working here. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is a great working yeah. environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. We follow something. Have you heard of polarity management? No, is that I term not. familiar with? It's a, it's almost like a figure eight. So if I draw a figure eight and it's okay. like an, a side, like an infinity loop sideways, mm -hmm. Um, things are always held in tension. So yes. there's always a balance. So if you have profit on one side and purpose on the other, you need to, you're always ebbing and flowing between both of oh, them, basically. That's a really great yeah, the, the polarity management teaching is a whole other podcast. Like there is a lot of material there that is about nothing is a problem to be solved. Everything is a tension to be managed. So when we have experienced, oh, yeah. Say it again. Yeah, nothing in business is a problem to be solved. Everything is a tension to manage. Okay. So if we only lived to make profit, for example, yeah. Yeah. and that was the problem to be solved, we would experience all the downsides of not having any purpose. When we lived in the early days, truthfully, the yeah. same as you, like we had a dream yeah. culture a little bit, like yeah. we are going to, that you're going to love working here for sure. Yeah. And when we stayed there and put too much time and emphasis and resources, training, whatever, we experienced the downside of not actually having a closely aligned sales and recruiting team. Like they yeah. just actually didn't know how to do their job yeah. super well because we hadn't focused on that. And so we learned, it was like a boot camp. Like people go to school for three years for change management. Yeah. We went to that school basically, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. we lived that school. Yeah. We're like, oh, then we'll never do that again. Like this is how you do that. You got and so yeah, we did <laughs> and we paid for it. Yeah. Um, just like with blood, sweat and tears yeah. not cash and uh, I think life is a good school you know but yeah. there is um we will we will always now live in that tension and it really needs to be holding still our purpose in one hand like and our purpose you know we did that in a lot of different ways eventually like we came away from the culture mentality being like, it's about you and you loving working here. It's mm -hmm. about far more than that. It's yes. about you actually being great to work with. So your peers enjoy working with you. Yeah. And it's about actually some of the money we go, we make together as a company yeah. going into, into a foundation, which you will help choose and direct like where those funds go out Got into it. the community. So we'll invite you into that, but we have to make money to do that. So let's focus on doing that super, super well. And the truth is that now I wouldn't say we're perfect. We're not like a perfectly well-oiled machine yeah. but I think we get this now and people love winning actually like you know that you've done really well when you win and you actually have a great year and we're super transparent with our financials so people know ahead of time when things aren't looking great and they're really aware when we're doing great and then they share in that we have an amazing profit um, sharing model where they will all everybody will benefit when we have a great year so it's like don't muzzle the ox while he's threshing absolutely everybody gets a piece of the action yeah yeah. And that's part of the way that you stay profitable. I think so. I mean, I don't truly, like, at an ideal perspective, believe that, like, the carrot model of incentivizing people mm -hmm. is the thing that will fundamentally motivate somebody. Mm -hmm. I think that belonging and a sense of purpose will fundamentally motivate somebody and being getting to be involved in the reality of yeah. creating it as opposed to just feeling like a cog in the wheel. However, um, there is intrinsic motivation to be found in, like, when it's a great year. Everybody benefits. Yeah, it's, I think it's that point of, of intention. Yep. Everything's intentional. Absolutely. So it's it's not just uh, the carrot. Yeah. And it's not just the identity and ownership. No, and, it needs and to be both. It's got to be both, right? Yeah. 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 Last question is, <laughs> uh, we always love to ask this question, what does it mean to be a cultural catalyst? I think it's somebody in the world who's actually doing it. So yeah. you can have great ideas and you can really believe that things could be done, but are you willing to actually get your hands in there and be like, ooh, here we go. Like, I'm going to take a risk and get my hands all the way in. And in my case, you know, leave just the social justice world and be like, God, you still love and value the business people. Like, there's so many verses in the Bible about wealth and poverty, there as is. you know. And I felt so justified as a young person in my poverty-focused career. And I needed to really, in humility, step into being like, I can be a business owner and leader who worships God with my work every day. And um, for me, that sacrifice is like what a cultural catalyst is. Are you willing to, in humility, take a step and just be like, not big for yourself and not attempting to be big for the kingdom, but to just serve people with what you're called to do really well with excellence? That's it. Yeah, there's so many people uh, in the Christian world that 
you know, wealth uh, is uh, almost a cuss word. I know. And and poverty, I, I don't know that people would actually say this with a phrase mm -hmm. as much as they would live it with a life. Mm -hmm. That that you know, poverty is somehow spiritual. Yes. And yet, on the other side, we're always trying to, you know, create places where we can take offerings for people who are in oh, poverty. Yeah, I know. Which is kind of like a really strange, like that, I don't even see that as intention. I just see that as deception. Yeah. It, they, if poverty is a value, why are we taking offerings to help people in Ooh, poverty? I know. Right? So yep. kind of kind of a, a kind of a really strange mm -hmm. idea. But yeah, I really love what you said. How can people learn more about Kate Matson? You did it. I did it. Um, my email address is probably best. Okay. It's um, my name, Kate, K-A-T-E, at raise, R-A-I-S-E dot net. Dot net. Thank you so much for being on. Super interesting. I'm going to have you on again. We can talk about that other subject that we, we brought up there and okay. talk about how do we actually transform the world. Next time. Thanks so much, Kate. Thank you. God bless you. I hope that you'll follow us. Hope you love this. And uh, this was uh, really, really interesting. By the way, download that chart. Uh, get on the link right there. Look at that chart and just really study that chart because I think that's a really interesting concept. By the way, mm -hmm. I'm going to do that myself. Have fun. And, uh, and, and just talking through... What does it look like to have an empowering culture? Not just at work, actually. I think that chart would actually work for many things in life. Well, God bless you. See you later.